Listen now for the word of God. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found where the place the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to him, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you for your word. And I pray that this morning you will pour your word through me. Pour your word, not my word, your word, not my opinion. Your word for us this day that will touch us at our point of need and equip us to be the people that you're calling us to be. I pray this. I pray this in your holy name. Amen. One of the highlights of my week is a recurring meeting that I have with a few guys at 6 a.m. on Friday mornings. We gather at that time because mostly the fever of life is still at bay. We meet uh, in person in the conference room and we meet there most days because we're joined by Zoom from a couple of guys, some in North Charleston, some out in Mount Pleasant, some in uh, a fellow from Newport News, North Carolina, and someone else from Charlotte. All people gathering to discuss the nature of our lives. We, well, some times we hear a baby in the background. <laughs> Sometimes there's a dog that needs to be let out. Sometimes we see that people shave and sometimes they haven't, but it's not a sartorial competition. We begin the day chewing on a chapter of the book that we've chosen the book that's been presented to us or has been mysteriously placed before us by someone that allows us to look at our faith, allows us to grapple with some issues, some biblical, some cultural, some personal, but always in light of what it means to be a follower of Christ. The books we've chosen to engage have been sparked by wonderful conversations and always seem to be edifying for us. I'm a fan of small group model because that way you come to know each other. You come to trust each other. You can express your doubts and your disagreements and we can share in those aha moments and the revelation that comes with taking our spiritual lives seriously. Now right now we're engaging a book by Rabbi Harold Kushner. Nine essential things I've learned about life. Rabbi Kushner is a fellow who wrote a book that has had a profound effect on people who have sought to lead good lives, who have sought to lead disciplined lives, one might even say godly lives, and then tragedy strikes. His three-year-old son was diagnosed with a degenerative disease that they also said he would only live until his early teens. So Kushner, father, husband, rabbi, was faced with one of the most difficult questions of life. Why? Why God? You know, years later, Krishna wrote a straightforward and elegant contemplation of the things that had happened, of the doubts and the fears that arise when tragedy strikes. It was called When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Now, the book that we're studying was published in 2015, and it has him reflecting, reflecting from the perspective of a life lived over the decades. He's in his 80s now. 
uh, of a man who has encountered similar challenges as we do, we who follow the Christ. He speaks of congregants, congregants in the temple that he serves, who have found that religion as it's been presented to them throughout their lives is unworthy of either their intellectual respect or their emotional attachment. And he has covenanted with them, he has agreed to be in relationship with them to show them not how old time tested their religion is, but how true belief can answer their most profound questions, questions about relationship, questions about life's unfairness, about right and wrong, about revenge and forgiveness, and about the meaning and the purpose of their lives. You know, I believe that we face the same challenges, we who seek to follow Jesus, so this morning, I want to establish perhaps again what we have been taught and might sometimes forget that Jesus was steeped in the First Testament. Jesus was steeped in the Old Testament. Examining the four Gospels, we have a great amount of information to work with. It can simply be stated in two words, total trust. Jesus accepted the Old Testament scriptures as being divinely authoritative. He never cast doubt on any of them, any of the accounts recorded in it. It appears that Jesus assumed the people were actual, people and the events that literally occurred. This is seen in Old Testament scripture. He accepted the two main divisions of the Old Testament, the law and the prophets. And he quoted from 14 individual books of the Old Testament. Jesus said, you search the scriptures, the first testament, because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, he says in the Gospel of John. So he recognized the two divisions of the Old Testament, the law and the prophets. And he said, think not that I come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And Jesus also made a reference to the third section of the Old Testament, the Psalms. On the day of his resurrection, he said to his disciples, while well, I was still with you, I told you everything written about me in the law of Moses, the books of the prophets, and in the Psalms, that these things had to happen. And then he helped them understand the scriptures. He told them, he told them that the scriptures say that the Messiah must suffer. Then three days later, he will rise from the dead. Luke 24. So today and throughout June, we will engage. We will engage in the Old Testament, we'll engage in the teaching of Rabbi Harold Kushner and see how it leads to, it points to, and both testaments embolden and enrich each other. So today, we begin. It's an introduction. Nine essential things I've learned about life. We'll engage the teachings that Jesus knew, believed, and taught through the lens of the Savior's love. So you may wonder, how can we address nine things that I've learned about life in four weeks? Well, now three coming up. Well, the truth of it is, let's look at the list. Lessons learned along the way. First of all, Kushner found that his seminary training didn't necessarily equip him to answer some of the questions he fielded on the street and in the coffee shop. And number two, God is not a man who lives in the sky. You see, we've determined before, together, that God is beyond the confines of gender and that Jesus, the enfleshed God, came to establish on earth as it is in heaven. Number three, God doesn't send the problem. God sends us the strength to deal with the problem. Number four, forgiveness is a favor you do yourself. Uh, number five, some things are just wrong, and knowing them makes us human. Number six, religion is what you do, not what you believe. And number seven, leave room for doubt and anger in your relationship with God. To feel better about yourself, find someone to help. And finally, give God the benefit of a doubt. Nine chapters, three weeks because we've dealt with some of these issues before. Now, we will send out this week, by midweek, the topics for the next three weeks with some points that you can ponder and that you can bring you know, as, we, as we study this together. 
Um, now the rabbi ends his book, which so far has been his last, with what he calls a love letter to the world that, that may or may not deserve it. Here's what he said. Dear world, we've been through a lot together over the past eight decades, you and I. Marriages and births and deaths, fulfillment, disappointment, war and peace, good times, hard times. There were days when you were more generous to me than I could possibly have deserved. And there were days when you cheated me out of things I felt I was entitled to. And there were days when you looked so achingly beautiful that I could hardly believe that you were mine. And there were days when you broke my heart and reduced me to tears. But with it all, Rabbi Krishna said, I choose to love you. I choose to love you whether you deserve it or not. And how does one measure that? I love you in part because you are the only world I have. I love you because I like who I am better when I do. But mostly I love you because it makes it easier for me to live my life grateful for today and hopeful about tomorrow. And he closed by saying, love does that. Well, men and women, our gratitude and our hope and our lives are built on Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, and his righteousness. And we shall engage the themes of the chapters of this book because it comes from the foundation on which Christ's teaching was formed. And we will engage and discuss and we'll approach these next few weeks, as always, through the eyes of Jesus, through the lens of our Savior's love, who loved us to his death and strengthens us through his mystical communion. Come, let us go to the table. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.